Yes. Is it visible, sir? Y yes, it's visible. Go to slideshow. You can continue. Yes, it's sir. visible now. Yeah. Sorry for the delay. No, no, no problem. This happens. Uh, now, in OSCE pattern examination, uh, we will go through five short cases, but we have to go a bit rapidly. Um, let us start with the first case. May I request uh, the first participant to uh, read out or I should read out? No, he can read out. Just uh, you project, he will read out and he continue with the uh, question. Okay. A 45 year old woman presented to, uh, oh, sorry, just a minute. A five year male child presented with history of absence of rice testes in the Ch Change the slide, Dr. Ghosh. Change the slide. Next slide. You can go to slide show, it will show full screen. Sir, can you see case one? I can see case one, but uh, the next slide is not coming. You can go to slide show. Yes, sir, I mean slide show. Uh, but uh, screen is can not changing. That is on the side, but not in the view. Artho, your slides are not moving. Yes, yes. Hello. Uh, yeah. Slides yes. are not moving. You are still you are still finding the title slide. Yeah, yeah. Mm. And 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 uh, and on the right hand corner, those extra things are also seen. Still, not going to slide view. Yes, My yes. desktop, it is showing. Yes, yes, now it is coming. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Okay, now it has come up. Now it has yeah, come yeah. up. Five year male child, yes. A five year male child presented with a history of absence of right testes in the scrotum since birth. Parents noticed a small swelling in the right groin for last six months. The swelling appears when the child stands up, walks, or strains or cries, and the swelling disappears only on lying down. Now, on examination, the left scrotal sac is well formed and the left testis is well seen and palpable. Next slide, change. Slide is unchanging. Next slide. Yes, it's gone to the picture. Yes. The left scrotal sac. Yeah is well formed and the testis, left testis is well seen and palpable. The left hemiscrotum is ill formed and the right testis is not palpable in the right scrotal sac. The testis is also not palpable in the inguinal canal or in the other ectopic sites. On standing, a swelling is found which is confined to the left inguinal, uh, to the right inguinal canal. Yeah, right, yes. Uh, there is an expansile impulse on top of the swelling and the swelling reduces easily on spontaneously on lying down. Now I think you can uh, see the picture. Yes. Now, how to examine this child? Now, in an OSCE pattern of examination, something sometimes it happens. The child is there, and your examination examiner can ask you to examine the child, and uh, he or she will observe you and there is a checklist by which you can get the points. Now, may I request the first participant? Yeah. Are you there? Yes, so I think I think Dr. Shuman has not joined, so uh, we sir, can... Jyoti, Jyoti. Jyoti. Uh, uh, sir, sir, good mo sir, good morning, sir. Good morning. Um. Yes. Sir, I will examine the child in a standing position, sir. Okay. Hello. Uh, yes. Yeah. Yes. I will examine the child in handling position and I will ask the uh, child to uh, make in a uh, bonnet uh, position, sir, armchair position, holding the child with the uh, knees flexed and. Uh, So that the increase in the abdominal pressure and will make the swelling more prominent. Yeah, that is for the. So you were suspecting a, a hernia in this case. Hernia, hernia, yes. With the... anything else? 
sir and understand the test is also sir as left to right hemispotomy is und- Ill- Ill- developed and sir, test is also not possible so to examine a child in uh, case of an undescended test is uh, you have to first you have to examine the child in a warm room where the yes. reflex are uh, not that strong uh, the child should be in the lying position first you inspect the groin and the scrotum and the penis that area first don't touch the child then you first touch the child child at the anterior superior iliac spine but two of your fingers so that the, your fingers walk from the uh, uh, anterior superior iliac spine towards the pubic tubercle and during that you must squeeze the soft tissue so that you can push the soft tissue towards the pubic tubercle so if the swelling is not when I mean, the test is is not palpable it may become evident during this palpation right even you can come in the child in a cross leg sitting position or squatting position to uh, make a make the little test is palpable yes am i clear yes sir yes so oh, fine after that you check for Take the child in the standing. If you are able to palpate the palpate the testes, then you try to bring the testes down to the scrotum. There, there may be three situations. In one situation, you will not be able to bring the testes into the scrotum. In other situations, you may be able to bring the testes into the scrotum. But if the testes retracts back into the uh, back into the inguinal canal without any, uh, I mean. Uh, without any cremasteric reflex then it is a what it is it? you can bring down the testes but the testes goes back sir retractile testes because of hypercremasteric no without cremasteric reflex if it goes back then it is an undescended <laughs> testes but in case of retractile testes it remains in the scrotum and only goes back if the cremasteric okay yes so this is this is how then you uh, go on examining the hernia as usual right yes. yes so these are the important points now what is your diagnosis in this case sir uh, right side and undescended uh, undescended testes with the right side in one hand yes It's a right-sided, impalpable, undescended testis. It is as it is not palpable in this particular case. So for yes, the diagnosis, you have to mention three things. Number yes. one, whether it is unilateral or bilateral. Number one. Number two, the palpable or impalpable. This is the most important classification that you should practice nowadays. Yes, palpable or impalpable, and whether it is associated with any other anomalies. as uh, like hernia or any other congenital yes. other you uh, can get right so these three yes. things must be mentioned in your diagnosis yes okay sir what will be your next step when you don't get a palpable test this what will be your next step sir uh, if i'm not get uh, one question not... one question before he, this she answer this a uh, patient has got impalpable testes what yes, are the what are the possibilities of a stitching impalpable testes sir it can be an absent testes it can be an undescended testes and uh, um, absent undescended undescended hindered and or vanishing 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 testes when and what else impalpable means sir, you are you are doing a clinical examination it is sir, there, there is but this. clinically clinically that cannot be discerned got my point the test is there in inguinal canal but the clinician examining he cannot palpate this so a, a, a difficulty test. no no not at all even even small test is in a child like this maybe impalpable but still in the inguinal canal so it's a clinically not discernible okay, okay. the next question was dr goshaski sir how do you hmm. go about from this point as the testis is impalpable and uh, uh, sir usually i can go with the usg bilateral inguinal scrotal region and uh, 
even with mri it's difficult to find with the uh, test uh, test in the abdomen so i can go for diagno diagnostic laparoscopy if it is uh, i will proceed further later on depends on findings in laparoscopic so in this case practically you can directly go for a uh, <laughs> diagnostic laparoscopy okay you need not to go for yeah. In, in these cases nowadays actually see ultrasound is an extension of clinical examination some examiner will prefer that you do ultrasound because ultrasound is not part of your uh, clinical examination even the ward by <laughs> residents so ultrasound yeah. you can answer and then next don't uh, utter mri don't say yes. mri ct is not it's not required to be uh, mentioned at all so uh, extension of clinical examination is ultrasound and followed by the gold standard is now Diagnostic laparoscopy. Yes. Can you proceed to manage this case? Yes, sir. If uh, uh, in diagnostic laparoscopy, if I can see the testicular vessels uh, after the deep inguinal ring, it means testis is descended into the uh, inguinal canal. So if I am not able to see the, if there is a mm, sudden mm, stoppage of the testicular vessels, means it can be atrophic testis or absent testis. so after, uh, after after giving general anesthesia please yes. repalpate the inguinal canal whether it is palpable or not yes. after that you put the laparoscope if it is not palpable and then you see whether the vessels are visible or any the cord structures are visible at the internal ring or not yes. if, if the cord structures are visible at the uh, visible and they are blind ended then the test is absent this is absent if you see the cord structures is passing through the internal ring then you have to react, you have to look at the inguinal canal for mm -hmm. the test if you get the cord structures with the blinded edge inside the uh, i mean the inguinal canal then you have to send the tip for the biopsy to look for right. the test right yes but the management yes. remains ha huh? orthopedics uh, orthopedics What are the advantages? Why do you want to do our PFX? Sir, as the anesthesia has more uh, uh, complications, uh, so we have to go for. So, what are the complications that can be reduced by our PFX? Sir, torsion and uh, torsion test is same. Uh, sir, anesthesia has more chance of uh, some malignancies like fibromas and uh, thing. Infertility chances and. Uh, So we can reduce malignant mal uh, seminoma uh, malignancy conditions under torsion. So actually, uh, most important is actually the psychological aspects of the child and the cosmosis. And of course, if you can bring down the testes uh, before one year of age, you can increase the fertility. Now, in case of inguinal testes, I mean a palpable testes, uh, and you, uh, I mean uh, unilateral palpable testes, uh, fertility is not uh, an issue. Affected. <laughs> It's an issue in case of bilateral intra-abdominal testes, and uh, it is doubtful whether you can reduce the chance of malignancy because uh, the testes are uh, itself abnormal. So uh, probably the chances are not less, but in some books, even in daily lab, it is written you may reduce the chance of malignancy if you do it uh, uh, before the before one year of age. But it is not true. Now, what malignancy will happen if you? Uh, If you don't uh, bring down the testes from the abdomen, Partho, can you please change your slides? Madam, the the next slides. When we are we are just finding, we are just seeing the three blocks you have made of. Uh, uh, yeah, right, right, right. And the before, no, you have gone faster. It's happening. Ah, hey, man, all of you have gone down to the. Iske pehle wala, er aage ja. स्टूडेंट्स Because he has gone to the next question of orchidopexy, na? That's why. Yeah. 
there is a technical problem in the slide sharing mode it is not happening now uh, yeah, yeah yeah but as they are animated slide i cannot uh, escape the slide sharing mode that is the problem okay now you can see yes yes so you have the algorithm for uh, so the main problem is with the uh, <laughs> most important advantage is the cosmetic and the psychological aspect of the child uh, when the child grows number two the fertility as i have already told and last the malignant i just give, want to give you one information to remember the risk appears to vary with the donor's location 1% with the inguinal with the 5% with the abdominal testes and cancers please remember cancers arising in the testes that remain in the abdomen are most frequently the seminomas but malignancy is arising of the successful orthopexy regardless of the original location are most frequently non seminomatous germ cell tumors now so this is uh, something that you should okay. keep in mind so what happens yes, is if you do a do an orthopexy and so let us move to the next case i think right a 65 years lady presented with an ulcer in her left leg the ulcer developed over the scar of a burn injury that happened 25 years back there is a history of repeated ulcer formation solving by healing with proper wound care major is there for more than a year and appears to be aggressive only for last two months now i will show you the picture on examination there is a area of scar in the left thyroid area of scar and the ulcer over the scar is irregular in shape size is approximately 5 into 4 cm the margin appears to be rolled out the floor is covered by necrotic tissue the base is indurated but free from the underlying structures the ulcer has not extended to the normal skin there are no palpable lymph nodes in the draining basin now if this is the picture what would be the most anybody else no nee, next 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 person uh, ishita ishita ka name ishita ishita Hello, Dr. Ishita. I think she was there. Yes, sir, she is there, but uh, on mute. Unable to mute. Ishita, can you unmute? Yes, yes, sir, yes, sir. Yeah, yeah. Please. What is the likely diagnosis with the history and examination? Sir, uh, this is the uh, is a case of a uh, Marjolin ulcer, sir. Developing our a. So they were doing over a previous burn contract. And the location? It will be a complete answer. Will you describe, na? The site? Yes, yes. Why are you telling it's a marginal ulcer? Sir, uh, because uh, ulcer over a uh, ulcer over a previous burn contracture is uh, usually usually uh, it gets into malign it turns malignant and it is. I cannot get you actually properly. Sir, also over a previous um, um, previous burn site uh, turns malignant. And then the description you use the. a uh, description of the an examination to say that this is a malignant ulcer over a pre existing scar okay. is all described yes sir so to uh, tell it a marginal ulcer actually it must be within the area of the scar number 1 number 2 before the onset of the ulcer there must not be uh, i mean uh, must not be uh, any other lesion i mean any other uh, malignant appearing lesion in that area and there must be a, a duration before the ulcer appears on the scar 
So uh, if you follow the history and the appearance of the star, obviously it points towards the diagnosis of, of, of a marginal cancer. So what will be your next step? Uh, sir, uh, next step I will like to go for uh, a wedge biopsy, sir, and uh, a local uh, lymph node examination. The examination is done. No lymph node palpable. What do you expect? Do you expect the lymph node to get involved in marginal ulcer? So, uh, sir, usually it does not get involved. But Why? when the... Uh, sir, Why? because uh, the lymphatics around the uh, scar uh, is damaged. Because it's already burned site. So, lymphatics around that area is damaged. So, it usually does not get involved. But in case the... Um, the uh, ulcer starts spreading beyond the scar, that time it can get rapidly uh, involved. From where you want to take the biopsy? Uh, sir, uh, from the periphery, sir, uh, taking uh, healthy skin and the uh, ulcer. Okay, when do you want to take the uh, biopsy from the periphery, not from the center? Sir, uh, because central necrosis, mm. there may be presence of cent central necrosis and the whole point of biopsy will get uh, nullified. And what is there in the periphery? So periphery, there will be actively uh, dividing cells. Yes. If in the malignant ulcer, the most proliferating cells are in the periphery. In case of a scar, actually, uh, by definition, a carcinoma arises from the epithelium. It doesn't actually cannot arise from the scar. So it actually arises from the epithelium at the periphery of the ulcer. And of, of course, the turnover is highest at the periphery. Uh, yes. Some people say to compare the normal and the malignant site. Is, that is not the answer. I uh, don't do the biopsy from the junction to find the difference between normal skin and the malignant area. It is to find that this uh, most proliferating cell in the periphery and whether the invasion into the normal skin. Okay. Now, uh, what, what, what is the most common histology you are going to, you are expecting? Uh, sir, uh, squamous cell carcinoma, sir. Sir, hyperkeratosis, parakeratosis and um, keratin pulse. So, right. So, uh, squamous cell carcinoma is the most uh, likely diagnosis. And if, if you just follow this one, uh, here, the, in this case, it has developed in a burn wound, but it can develop, this SCC, the Marduvin ulcer can develop in other wounds even. You know that I'm not going into detail, but a burn scar can give rise to other type of carcinomas. Also keep in mind, they are burn scar carcinomas, they are not, they may not be a Marduvin ulcer, but other type of carcinomas are also possible in a burn scar. So a scar tissue carcinoma may be many things, but in a scar tissue, when a, a, a SCC develops, we call it a margillion ulcer. Now, there are some macroscopic types. It's not only always, a, a, always an ulcer. It may be an exophytic growth even. And if it is an ulcerative, that is more aggressive. But if it comes with a, uh, I mean, overwhelming uh, granulation uh, tissue type look, it is less aggressive. Please remember. Now, how uh, margillion ulcer spreads? Sir, how are? Marjulin ulcer spreads. Sir, uh, they spread by lymph uh, uh, lymphatic spread, sir. Uh, lymphatic and local, sir. But as it is, it is divided of lymphatics, the scar tissue. Sir, it is initially that's why marjulin ulcer um, uh, it does not spread, sir. But when it gets gets beyond the scar tissue, that time it can spread uh, like small, uh, like squamous cell carcinoma through lymphatic spread, aggressively. Right. right. So first, can you see my slides? Uh, no, sir. I can see what are the macroscopic types of marjolin. Problem. What is happening? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's changing. Now, what are the peculiarities of a margillin ulcer? Sir, it is... So, you have already... Pardon, sir? It is a... You have already answered. Just uh, summary. First, it is a slow-going one. It's a pain there because lack of nerve. And secondary deposits are usually not found in the region and it nodes until it has invaded the normal tissue. 
Yes, sir. Now, if you compare the prognosis of the margarine ulcer with other type of de novo squamous cell carcinoma, continuously appearing squamous cell carcinoma, uh, how will be the prognosis? Uh, Better or bad? No nerve, no lymphatics, poor blood supply in the scar. Sir, Actually, this is, this is described as a low grade. Marginal ulcer is a low-grade squamous cell carcinoma, and obviously the prognosis will be good, better yes, than sir. a squamous cell carcinoma. Uh, you detected early, sir. But actually, the prognosis is poor in case of marginal ulcer, and the aggressive types of squamous cell carcinoma, um, they are actually the carcinomas which arise in the transplant patient, who arise in the scars and ulcers. And the anaplasm, I mean the poorly differentiated uh, squamous cell carcinoma, they are actually more aggressive. So, marginal ulcer actually uh, have a poor prognosis than uh, other type of squamous cell carcinoma. Is it okay? Now, what is the role of imaging? You need an any imaging for this. Uh, sir, uh, we will need imaging to just know for the uh, lymph, just know the lymph node status, sir. Yes, generally we don't need. If it invades the deep tissue, then and then only we need. Uh, suppose it has invaded the bone, you are thinking, or any vascular structure underlying. Then and then only you need imaging. Otherwise, you don't need the image. Now, what will be the management? So, what will be the? What What will be the treatment? I'm sorry, sir. I am not being able to hear How do you treat this patient with the ulcer? Yes, what sir. is the standard treatment for marginal ulcer? Sir, um, wide local excision uh, followed by reconstruction of the margin. What would be the margin? The margin is one centimeter, sir, uh, beyond the scar yes. tissue. So actually, you have to excise one. As it is more aggressive, actually you have to take two centimeter margin. In case okay. of marginal ulcer, in case of squamous cell carcinoma, we generally take one centimeter margin. Okay. So what is lymph, what about the lymph node dissection? If uh, if positive, uh, then we will go for lymph node dissection. Yes. Otherwise, no role of prophylactic uh, uh, lymph node dissection. Any role of radiotherapy? Uh, sir, uh, radiotherapy to the local site can be a treatment in initial uh, cases when the patient is unfit for OT that time. Yes, actually, uh, as it is poor in vascularity, radiotherapy doesn't work well. So, in case of uh, irresectable uh, malignancies like this, if you are in the skull, dealing with, you cannot resect it properly, only then only you can go for radiotherapy, or otherwise, if you have done, if you went for uh, I mean, lymph node dissection and there is residual disease, there is only role of radiotherapy. Other, there is no role of radiotherapy. Okay. okay. Now, let us move to the next case. Thank you, sir. A 46 years non lactating premenopausal lady presented with unilateral bloody nipple discharge. <laughs> 46 years premenopausal, non lactating. Unilateral bloody nipple discharge. Dr. Atik. Is Atik yes, sir. Yes, yeah, sir. Please, please. Now, how to proceed? How to, how to take the history properly? Uh, so in case of uh, nipple discharge, uh, we will ask the patient about uh, the unilaterality and bilaterality. Here it is mentioned that it is a unilateral bloody discharge. We will uh, check whether it is a spontaneous uh, or uh, comes out on pressing. Uh, so yeah, unilateral bloody discharge, uh, most likely it will be as a malignant, uh, con it will be associated with a malignant condition, sir, and not a benign cause. Uh, no, no, because no, 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 don't make a blank statement. Oh, okay, sir. more 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 causes of bloody discharge are benign than malignant. Don't make a blank statement. You just approach. How do you approach? Sir, yeah. Triple assessment, sir, through triple assessment of the breast. Uh, we'll do a clinical and uh, cl uh, clinical examination with history. Uh, watch out. No, that is history. Actually, I am asking about the history. 
So either it is a unilateral or bilateral, you are absolutely right. It is spontaneous or self <laughs> It is single duct or a multiple duct discharge. And of course, the nature of the nature. discharge, in this case, it is a bloody one. But in other little discharge cases, they were forget to take this, uh, I mean, the associated history, like hypothyroidism, pituitary tumors, like amenorrhea, visual disturbance, and headache. Then the drugs, which produces galactoria, sometimes. So these, uh, these are the things, the drug history, any pituitary neoplasma tumor history, and hypothyroidism most importantly and i one history i mentioned in the in, uh, in uh, i mean in, in the case capsule that a bloody discharge can be seen in case of pregnancy so history of pregnancy is very very important right now what in your next step what will be your next step you have to go for a clinical breast examination properly and i, I think uh, the pain history is also important because some uh, breast conditions uh, with mastalgia may have associated uh, discharge. Yes, sir. Mastalgia. Yeah. Yeah. Associated mastalgia. Yes. Yeah. And of course, the history of lump and mastalgia or other breast symptoms, the most common symptoms you have to ask for that I have not actually mentioned yet. Now, what are the differential diagnosis in this case? What is appearing in your mind? What the lady could... Uh, so it, uh, so it can be a well, ductal papilloma or uh, it can be a duct ectasia, sir. Yes, think benign first, then malignancy. Right. Now you are in the right path. Yeah. It is a introductal papilloma, papilloma, introductal carcinoma or duct ectasia. Duct ectasia. So it mostly are benign and you may miss introductal carcinoma. What would be your next step in a 46 years lady? Uh, we will uh, we'll proceed for a... Uh, Mammography, sir. Uh, yes. You are actually right. Whether there is any underlying uh, lump present. We are not missing any introductal carcinoma. So, if the mammography reveals something suspicious, what will be your next step? Uh, sir, but, but if uh, there is associated uh, lump in the mammography, then we can uh, proceed for a, a, tissue, a, a tissue biopsy, sir. If the mammography is negative, then what will you do? Uh, then uh, we, uh, we can do a ductal. Uh, uh, which is X. So we can... No, here comes the role of MRI. M see, uh, MRI. Yes, in, in a patient who got bloody discharge and you have suspicion of a lesion in the breast, and uh, here is the role for doing it. Okay. What is the role of cytology? Can we go for doctoscopy after this? Okay. What is the role of cytology? Um, uh, so I, I don't know, sir, that properly. Yes, you we don't practice it actually because of high false negative and high false positive presence. But you can go for a uh, ductography and ultra and HLE uh, will see sometimes uh, the lesions which are underlying the nipple area or a complex or dilatation of the dark, anything within the dark which is more than 0.5 centimeter can be picked up by this thing. And of course, you can, uh, if you are, if you are very much suspicious, you can go for MRI. What will be your next step if you don't get anything? But the patient so, is having a... Uh, so, we'll uh, proceed for surgery, sir. We can uh, do a wedge resection, including the duct. Uh, it's not wedge resection. There is a name for this. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, Microdocectomy, sir. Yes. One is microdectomy. If it is... If a single duct discharge and the duct can be located properly, then, but if you cannot do so, then we can go for a major, major duct, duct excision. Right? Now, here there is only pictures. Now, what is our thinking? Good Next. morning, sir. Yeah. Sir, uh, this is a, this is a uh, middle-aged lady presenting with the swelling in front of the in front of the ear lobule and lifting the ear lobule. Most probably, uh, most, straightforward swelling from the parotid region. Parotid region. Pleomorphic cardinomus, most probably. Yes, please. Pleomorphic cardinomus. Oh, why are 
it's, it's a parotid swelling actually. Yes. Maybe a pleomorphic adenoma. Because I have not supplied uh, you any information. No. Indeed. Yes. And that is intentional. Now, why are you telling it's a parotid swelling? Sir, uh, any swelling arising from the parotid region considered to be a parotid swelling unless and un until proved otherwise. Okay. Any other clinical examination that can help you uh, to fix, uh, to prove your diagnosis? Clinical examination. Sir, clinical examination, the swelling will be, uh, will not be mobile in the superior margin, sir. The swelling will be mobile horizontally and the lower margin, we can move the swelling. Cut in sign positive, sir. Yes, that is the cut in sign. You cannot move it over to diagrammatic. Right. So the location, as you have told, is below behind and slightly in front of the yellow view. Very evident in this case, which is raising the yellow view. It operated at the lumbar hollow below the lobule of the ear and dip to the parotid fascia. If you open the mouth, the swelling becomes less prominent. The cartilage screen, you cannot move it over the diagrammatic card because of the attachment of the parotid fascia and it is superficial to the masseter. If you ask the patient to clinch it, Tip, then the masseter will contract and the swelling will become more prominent. So, what are the clinical features that suggest that, uh, that the parotid swelling might be a malignant one? Sir, uh, usually points from the history: the patient will be old age lady. The uh, swelling will be rapidly progressive. Uh, the patient may complaining of pain. On examination, the swelling might be fixed to the structure, uh, involvement of the skin, or <coughs> swelling, presence of lymph nodes. Any symptom of facial nerve palsy? Patient can complain. Uh, sir, uh, yes, sir. Patient may complain of symptom of facial nerve palsy, like unable to uh, the food will get collected in the vestibule, uh, deviation of mouth, yeah. difficult to close the eye, yes, close the eyes, uh, uh, loss of drinking for it. Also, the involvement of the facial nerve, either the patient has signs and symptoms of facial nerve involvement. So now, so rapid growth and pain sometimes appears now. Of if the skin changes is very important, it sticks to the skin, the surface, and the facial nerve involvement, enlarge ipsilateral cervical lymph nodes. This is very important. The preauricular or the cervical lymph nodes. So mainly the rapid growth of fixity to the skin and the underlying structure, involvement of the facial nerve, enlarge ipsilateral cervical lymph nodes, and sometimes Christmas may need uh, I mean, no, difficulty in opening the mouth when involving the perigoid muscles, muscles by the uh, diplop malignancy. Now, how to uh, look for whether the diplop is involved or enlarged or not? Sir, uh, uh, on inspection, uh, the tonsillar fossa will be displaced medially. Yes. Uh, okay. Then by, by, by digital, on palpation, by, by digital palpation, we can palpate the uh, deep lobes. Very good. So not going into that. So how will you, if, if you are thinking it's a benign parotid swelling, how will you proceed? Sir, uh, investigation is to confirm my diagnosis, support and stage my diagnosis, and to proceed with the management of the patient. For confirming my diagnosis, I would like to proceed uh, with the USG as a part of my clinical examination, then image guided uh, FNAC from the swelling, sir. This will uh, uh, help me to go further evaluate the patients. Okay, so you want to image the swelling as well as you want to? Put get the image get the FNAC from the swelling. Okay, very good. Now, uh, when you want to go for a CT, sir, uh, if I am suspecting of any bony involvement, I would like to proceed with CT. If I am suspecting any facial nerve involvement of the soft tissue involvement, then I would like to proceed with the MRI of the swelling. Sir. So you do MRI CT for a small uh, benign parotid swelling. Sir, usually CT is not required for any small yes. clinical. If you clinical have a clinical is... assessment that swelling is mobile, you can palpate the swelling, no facial nerve palsy, and uh, it's not a routine to have CT. But malignant parotid tumor, fixed tumors, yes, deep lobe tumors, facial yes, nerve involvement are the indication yes. for either a CT or MRI. Yes. So these are the four indications actually. Deep lobe parotid has had told. I'm not going into that. A recurrent tumor, large tumor, neurologically symptomatic, or deep lobe tumor. So these are the four uh, areas where we should go for RCT or MRI. Now, uh, 
both the modalities are helpful in determining tumor site extension spread through the capsule in the extraparenchymal tissues or for carotid encasement in rare cases and mri scan with gadolinium always should be uh, the contrast should be given that is to be kept in mind and uh, if best delineates actually the perineural uh, spread or the or uh, the soft tissue infiltration but ct uh, is superior if the bony cortex is involved but if it is again deep into the bone which involves the marrow it is an mri is more sensitive so especially the my difference that you, we should get before advising any image now i'm not going into <coughs> role of pet now whether the fna is mandatory sir if it, usually we would sir in this uh, so we would like to document the diagnosis with the fna issue sir yes many uh, you uh, actually fna doesn't change the um, surgical mind but if you do fna prior to it actually now the patient counseling the expectations of the uh, patient the surgical planning this this is this becomes better so uh, now uh, almost all the cases we go for uh, fna uh, especially in large cases now what next sir if it turns to be benign swelling then we will do superficial parotid ectomy sir if it is located to the superficial lobe and yes. it is benign then we will go for a superficial parotid ectomy but if it is a malignant one sir uh, malignant one without involving the facial lobe will be total conservative parotid ectomy sir so fine so uh, what will what about the uh, what about the lymph nodes sir uh, section sir if the tumor is more than 4 cm t3 t4 tumors a lymph node palpable tumors recurrent tumors uh, i grade tumors in this case we would like to do uh, selective lymph node dissection sir very good so uh, generally we go for uh, uh, i mean an aggressive parotid ectomy in case of a malignant lesion if, if it is in the superficial superficial total radical whatever and if the cervical lymph node is present we have to go for um this uh, i mean this uh, lymph node dissection and provides post operative radiotherapy for all the patients except superficial t1 and t2 tumors of low grade histology and clear margin otherwise okay. we have to go for uh, ready sir uh, which histology is the worst uh, in prognosis for uh, malignant parotid malign sir uh, i grade mucoepidermoid carcinoma sir adenoid cystic carcinoma adenoid cystic sir yes we don't have much time let us move to the next yeah. phase yeah thank you sir i think the case is visible yes yes now there is a 50 year old male patient a painless swelling without prior evaluation he has not been evaluated anywhere else it's the most common presentation in case of uh, this type of swelling in the back part of the left arm which is 15 to 10 cm approximately in size heard in consistency dip to the dysplasia with restricted mobility on the contraction of the muscle the regional nodes are not palpable there is no discal neurovascular deficit the movements of the left elbow and the cell shoulder joint are within normal limits and abdominal and chest examinations or as per the symptoms and signs is concerned or concerned uh, they are within normal limit so what is the most possible diagnosis who is going to answer shuman has joined no uh, no sir he is not there sir if uh, any of the other yeah. participants uh, want to answer yeah jyoti can take over jyoti Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. Sir, can yeah, sir. It's a large swelling of the fifty years made involving the left arm. It's most probably the soft tissue sarcoma of the left arm, sir. Yeah. Soft tissue sarcoma of the left arm. Very good. Now, just I'm going very fast and not asking because we are lack the running short of time. There are some pitfalls in the clinical examination evaluation in history taking and examination. Uh, you have to ask for whether any etiological factor is present in the soft tissue sarcoma, like a history of radiation, any chemical exposure, whether he is working in a factory, any lymphedema. Suppose the patient has a history of 
axillary dissection, any neurofibromatosis, von Recklinghausen's disease, they are more prone. History of retinoblastoma operation in the childhood and, of course, family and polyposis for life. So these are the things that you must try to incorporate in your history. And never forget to look for any other swelling. It is a very common mistake in the examination. And um, the signs and symptoms of metastasis, examination of the involvement, which muscle group is involved, that is very important. And the most common pitfall is the examination of the distal neurovascular bundle and proximal lymphatic vessels. For irrespective of the nature of the swelling, all limb deep swelling, if in any case, in any limb swelling, you must look for these two things. Never forget distal neurovascular bundle, assessment of distal neurovascular bundle and proximal lymphatic vessel. Now, what investigation you want to do in this case? Sir, I want to go with the uh, MRI of the uh, MRI of the display. <coughs> MRI. Yes, sir. Anything else? You are right. Sir, MRI is. MRI. After MRI, I will go with the uh, core needle biopsy, sir. Guided biopsy. Core needle biopsy. So, Guided. there are three things actually that you have to keep, uh, two things in, during imaging. Uh, you, we image the primary site, right? And if yes. it is a sarcoma, we have also to, have to image. The metastatic site. Metastatic. The metastatic. A CT chase or chest radiograph is the most common thing that we need to perform in case of sarcoma. But in some cases, we have to go for CT abdomen, MRI, brain, or depending upon the situation. So we need to keep in mind that we have to image the primary site as well as to look for metastatic site. And next, you have to go for a coordinate biopsy. When not possible, or for VA, you can uh, incision. You can go for an incision biopsy, but of course, that must be done by an experienced right. surgeon. This is very, very important. And the biopsy site should be such: if you put a needle, it should be put to a point which can be excised at the time of surgery. Right. What will yes. be your management in this? Case? Sir, how you want to manage this case? Sir, uh, uh, the size of the uh, uh, swelling is 15 to 10 centimeters. So I need to go with the neoadjuvant uh, uh, treatment first, sir. Right. So first, neoadjuvant therapy, followed by? Followed by, if uh, clinically improving, then size is reducing, then I'll go with the surgery. Do you want to give radiotherapy in this case? Sir, no, but we want. You want to give radiotherapy in this case? No, no, sir, no, sir. Not new adjuvant, I'm talking about the adjuvant. Adjuvant, yeah, if the, uh, depends upon the uh, uh, tissue or uh, tissue specimen. Right. So new adjuvant of the in case of giving sarcoma and rhabdomyosarcoma, sarcoma. And in high grade cases, if it is more than 10 centimeters or more than Five centimeter in case of aggressive tumors like synovial sarcoma, round cell sarcoma, or pleomorphic sarcoma. So these are the indications. So you can go for if it is a high grade one, you can go for a new adjuvant chemotherapy. And then uh, radiotherapy is actually uh, indicated in all the cases of, of tissue sarcoma except two. This is better to remember in this way because if it is a low grade with negative margin or high grade with adequate margin in less than 5 cm of tumor. So if it is a high grade and more than 10 cm tumor, of course you have to give the patient the radiotherapy. Is it clear? So yes. low grade with negative margin or any high grade with adequate margin less than 5 cm tumor. In these cases, you don't need to give radiotherapy. Yes. Otherwise, you have to give radiotherapy in all the cases. Right? What is the surgical principle that is followed in case of crop tissue sarcoma? So it has to be wide local excision and uh, preserving the limb function. Yes. So the idea is to spare the function. Functional. Functional so, surgery. surgery. And most commonly the wide local excision. 
right? One centimeter margin of uninvolved tissue in all directions. Two centimeter margins are employed only in few cases where you are suspecting a huh? DFSP, a dermofibrosarcoma, or a myxofibrosarcoma. Where the margin is reduced, you have to go for a two centimeter margin, right? And okay. the important pitfalls are the surrounding skin should be always taken. You are not allowed to raise any flap, right? The limiting factors in obtaining the margin is actually the presence of neuro important neurovascular bundle. If it is related to the periosteum, but not has invaded the bone, you have to remove the periosteum. If it is related to the nerve, but has not engulfed it, then you are allowed to remove the perineurium. Uh, am I clear? Yes, sir. But, and in case of low-grade tumors, even you are allowed to, only in case of low-grade tumor, if it is through the tumor, you are allowed to buy half or buy half the tumor to release the neurovascular bundle from it. So you are not allowed to uh, give any. Uh, you are not allowed to raise any flap. That is the most important point. Yes. Right. And if the adjuvant radiotherapy is indicated, never forget two things. Number one, you have to place metallic tips. At the brain so that the radiotherapy can be planned and the surgical drain site must be close to the incision. So these are the two things that surgeon should keep in mind. One, yes. and one uh, placement of surgical drain <laughs> line on this. I think the time is over. Yeah, yeah. Uh, one one of the question. What are the things you consider for grading a uh, soft tissue sarcoma? Sir, uh, tumor grade and differentiation and necrosis. What is necrosis? Mitotic grade. Mitotic yes. So a, a score is given and you calculate the score and get the tumor. And now uh, you should not uh, give the clinical staging unless you have the grading. Yeah, the because grading. the clinical staging is also concerned the grading of sub mm -hmm. Okay. So we have a nice discussion. So these are the, you see, in OSCE scenario, you have thrown the slides and the questions. Answer has to be very specific. Whatever the examiner has decided, that answer has to come. So you have to be very specific about the answer. You will go to the question and try to uh, give the specific answer. So we have a nice discussion for this. We have not discussed everything of the short cases, but we have discussed the salient points, which can be a, a slight projection in able to answer that way. So any other comment from anyone else? No, no, Acharji is there, I think, today. Yeah, hi, good morning. Uh, th thank you, Professor Ghosh, for yeah, yeah. the structuring of the questions and selection of uh, cases. This, this was uh, really very good. Thank you. Thank you. We are trying to go into the few important things which are there in the OSCE uh, scenario. Because now yeah. they are putting OSCE questions, now it's very specific. And the most important points have been covered very well. Yeah, yeah. So as, as we have uh, started the message earlier, we will be starting our cycle uh, fresh from uh, May. We will start with hernias and basic chapter uh, uh, presentation. I request the senior uh, DNB students uh, and uh, MA students, please uh, uh, send the phone numbers of your the juniors who has joined. We want to include all the uh, new students in the first year presentation. And uh, I request you to please come up and present. Because there is a chance for presentation, you improve your uh, uh, skill of presentation. Okay, so send your uh, number to Milin so that he can uh, include you in the uh, uh, coming program. Thank you very much, Dr. Ghosh. We have a nice session today. Okay, Milin, you can conclude. Yes, thank you, sir. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you.